Hi, I'm Isabel Allen, Editor of Architecture Today. Welcome to Retrofitting Heritage, an AT webinar produced with content partner, The Reflight Company. We've got four presentations today, so let's have a look at what's coming up. Henrietta Billings, Director of Save Britain's Heritage, is going to tell us about the organisation's work in campaigning against the demolition of important buildings, with reference to two central London case studies, Richmond House on Whitehall and Marks and Spencer's flagship building on Oxford Street. Oliver Smith from Fifth Studio is going to present the practices refurbishment of New Court, Trinity College, Cambridge, and explain how they won consent to make the changes required to bring a Grade 1 listed building in line with modern day expectations around environmental performance and comfort. Peter Daniel, Product Innovation Director at the Roof Light Company, is going to run through some of the issues involved in achieving high performance and historic authenticity when using conservation roof lights. And Catherine Croft, Director of the 20th Century Society, will look at the challenges involved in retrofitting 20th century buildings and argue for greater clarity and transparency in communicating the environmental costs of demolition. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please do post your questions for any of the speakers as you think of them on the box on your screen. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Henrietta Billings, who is the director of Save Britain's Heritage. Henrietta. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's really a great pleasure to talk about retrofitting heritage. And today I want to um, talk about two specific cases that Save Britain's Heritage has been leading on. They happen to be in London, but they're sort of snapshots really of the kind of work that we do across the UK. Um, we, I want to really raise this point that heritage and um, retrofit really go hand in glove together. And that the old adage that we know well, the greenest building is the one that exists already is highly relevant and important today, particularly as the sustainability agenda increases um, across the public discourse. So before I go into the case studies, I wanted just to introduce you to Save Britain's Heritage and what we do. We are a campaigning organisation and we exist to defend historic buildings from demolition and de decay and neglect. We're a small team of six, and that's a mixture of full-time and part-time, and we work here in Farringdon um, from our offices, but we have a national reach. We work across the UK, and the type of buildings that we focus on range hugely from religious buildings to historic mills, grand country houses, terraced houses, um, post-war estates, as well as factory buildings, schools, and um, really, I don't think there is a building type that we haven't looked at over our 50-year um, period of um, being in action. We comment on planning applications. Uh, we offer advice to building owners and to local authorities. We submit listing applications, especially when it may help a building that's under threat or at risk of demolition. And most importantly, we work on alternative schemes for reusing historic buildings. We don't just say no to developers and, um, and demolition schemes. We try to come up with viable reuse alternatives, bringing together developers, architects, investors, and engineers to come up with alternative solutions. Now, this, uh, this phrase, the greenest building is the one that already exists, coined by the former chair of the American Institute of Architecture, really couldn't be more re relevant to what we're talking about today. And um, one of the things I really want to focus on is this point that demolition really should be the exception rather than the rule. And what we need to see is planners and local authorities using the tools already available to push back and refuse planning applications involving unnecessary and needless demolition. To put this in context, the um, what I wanted to say here was that construct, the construction sector accounts for about 45% of the UK's carbon emissions. Um, that, that's a huge uh, contribution in terms of talking about sustainability. And added to that, we lose more than 50,000 buildings per year through demolition. 
construction is far more carbon intensive than refurbishment, and these are using RICS industry benchmark figures. And so it's really important that um, we have this in the back of our minds as we as we go through these next two case studies. So the first one is Richmond House in Whitehall. This is a grade two star listed building built so recently in 1988 to 1990. It's is um, one of a very few, a very, very scarce handful of uh, listed buildings um, from the post-war era. Of the 500,000 listed buildings in England, only 0.02% are listed, which gives you uh, an inkling of, of the significance and the importance of this particular historic building. In terms of its location, you can see here in the foreground the cenotaph, um, and the way that um, the architect here has responded to the very important and somber setting of this building is to recede it um, on the pavement to allow um, members of the public to uh, have space to gather in and, and collect outside the cenotaph on important national days. This is a view of the rear of the building. This is not often seen because it's not open to the public, but this building, uh, th this view shows uh, a really fantastic facade in, in, in my view. It's a beautiful ziggurat, glass and bronze, and a really exciting uh, treatment for, for what is the rear facade of, of, a, of a building. And here you can see the interiors. These pictures give you an idea of the quality and the um, majestic feel, if you like, of, of, of the spaces inside the building. The architect himself, Sir William Whitfield, he um, was born in 1920 and died recently in 2019. He has uh, a, a great track record of fantastic buildings, including the extension to the Institute of Chartered Accountants in the City of London, the Savoy, rest, the, the Savoy Theatre, which he restored back to its Art Deco glory. Um, and also he is most well known as a cathedral architect. He designed the closes, the buildings in the closes of Canterbury, Hereford and St Albans cathedrals. So what's the threat to uh, Richmond House? Well, um, the threat was the almost complete demolition of Richmond House and um, this picture here sh in red shows the extent of the proposed demolition so everything really apart from that small area of facade um, on Whitehall. The proposals um, designed by AHMM Architects were to um, in its place construct a replica MP's chamber and that was designed to um, house MPs for a period of roughly seven years while the Palace of Westminster restoration works were taking place. It was designed to be an exact replica of the um, existing chamber in terms of size and seats, down, right down to the green leather of the um, chamber seats. We uh, argued right from the beginning that along with the 20th century society I should add that Richmond House is in good condition made of absolutely fine materials well designed and and really such a young building. The temporary chamber was an extremely expensive proposition which involved the major demolition of uh, the grade two star listed building and it was an extremely expensive project in environmental terms, it was simply unjustifiable. More importantly as well, there was no long-term plan for the temporary chamber. And um, in, in our view, it was a completely unjustified uh, demolition project. We worked with an architect to come up with an alternative plan for Richmond House, this in the spirit of, of working um, on, on alternative schemes. And we, um, working with Mark Hines, architect, we showed how, in fact, a temporary chamber could still be accommodated on this site, but it could actually be inserted within the existing courtyard of the existing building. You would be, in fact, retrofitting this building to um, keep the offices as existing, but also accommodate the a temporary 
um, chamber. And you can see from this diagram the various levels of, um, of the build. And you can see here my cursor is pointing to the chamber and the seats that would be um, craned in. And um, there he made provision for separate MP and public access. Um, uh, as well as full disability access. And um, uh, yeah, basically we were able to accommodate the size requirements and um, a, an, a viable alternative, which would be far cheaper to construct than the total demolition and replica chamber that was being proposed. Here you can see in plan um, how that new temporary chamber would slot in between um, the, the courtyard of the existing building. There'd be clear story roof lights to allow um, natural daylight and ventilation into the chamber, which would um, in turn reduce the carbon um, and uh, energy consumption of the building. And this uh, plan drawing just shows the um, security arrangements for um, MPs and staff and uh, members of the public and how the circulation space would work. We estimated with Mark that the uh, carbon, the, 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 the amount of carbon that would be lost as a result of the demolition of Richmond House was between 10 and 24,000 tonnes of CO2. That's the equivalent of over 15,000 flights from London to New York. We issued um, reports to highlight uh, what the, the, the threats to this building and, and our alternative scheme. And um, the temporary, the, the report that you see here on the left was that actually we, we published that and sent it um, to MPs in the House of Commons. And then this report on the right, the case for retention, was by Mark Hines and um, set out his alternative vision. We also worked with the University of Westminster to show how a retrofitted Richmond house, um, and by that I mean updating the um, operational energy demands of Richmond house, um, we were able to show that with a comprehensive retrofit, you could save the embodied energy costs associated with the new building and that the carbon emissions could be reduced by over 50%. This was the first time we'd worked with um, an academic institution looking at um, the alternative modelling for um, energy consumption on a, on a retrofit building. We also held an event at the House of Commons called Saving Time, Money and a Great List of Buildings. This was a symposium we um, hosted in 2019 and we had um, the 20th Century Society as well as our, his, um, architectural historians and architects and national organisations putting the case for the retention of Richmond House. The campaign received a lot of press attention and here are just a, a couple of clippings um, from the national papers. And we were really delighted. I mean, this was a campaign that lasted um, for over three years, but in um, earlier this year, in February, 2022, the body overseeing the proposals to demolish Richmond House was actually disbanded. Uh, the costs of the project had spiralled and um, it was decided that instead of building a replica chamber that MPs would stay um, in situ in the House of Commons while the restoration works rather than completely decanting them. But a wider a decision on the wider strategy um, for the restoration of the whole parliamentary estate is expected in 2023. Now, the next uh, second and final case study I wanted to share with you was the Marks and Spencers on Oxford Street. Now, um, this is an interesting building because, and an interesting case because it really seems to have hit a nerve with a lot of people and drawn a lot of interest. Now, and this is a campaign that we've been running alongside the 20th Century Society. It's a building um, you see here on the left, a flagship store for. Marks and Spencer's built in 1929. And interestingly, it was actually the first headquarters building for the department store. So it has a lot of history and is really very much part of 
that long tradition of prestigious department store buildings that everyone is familiar with and which um, most town centres and uh, cities across the UK have had at some point. And obviously they're going through a, a, a very di difficult time of turbulent change at the moment, but they're very, the buildings themselves represent a lot of history and important memories, as well as um, in the vast majority of cases, fantastic architecture. So the proposal um, on the uh, left is the building as we see it today. And on the right is the proposal for the demolition and rebuild of a building on this site by Pilbara and Partners Architects. Uh, this picture on the left is a close up of um, one of the facades, just to give you an idea of the quality of the detailing and um, of the architecture. It's not a listed building, but it is in a conservation area. And we think very strongly that this building reflects and echoes a lot of the qualities of the uh, fantastic architecture of Selfridges, which is right next door. This is a department store in the line of fantastic, majestic, prestigious buildings and was built to be noticed and to be seen. We, uh, the, 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 the campaign and the opposition that has been generated from lots of different quarters around the, the, these proposals has, has again received um, a lot of coverage in the national press. And we also have uh, started a petition with the 20th Century Society addressed to the um, bosses of m &S. Because of course, MS have some really ambitious and laudable um, sustainability targets. And, and we really wanted to draw the attention to the bosses about the, the, the demolition plans and how really they can't go counter to the image that um, Marks and Spencer's often um, very successfully portrays in terms of its care for the environment and sustainability. We've also just published, say Britain's Heritage has just published a um, publication on department stores across the UK and we feature Marks and Spencers in that publication but this also covers um, many department stores at risk of demolition across the UK and also highlighting some successful cases of where retrofitting and reusing these buildings um, has worked very well. So uh, in January this year, we also commissioned Simon Sturgis, a carbon and sustainability expert, to do a uh, analysis of the Marks and Spencer's building, comparing it to um, a, the, the, the environmental impacts of a demolition in new build versus a comprehensive retrofit. Simon Sturgis was a uh, good person to do this report because not only is he a, a sustainability expert and consultant, but he's also a consultant to the Greater London Authority, as well as um, the government and many local authorities. And in fact, he has been responsible for setting many of the policies um, in, in these institutions for, for sustainability. His analysis of the demolition proposals for the MS um, were, were really quite stark and, and said very clearly that the demolition proposals were inconsistent with ta tackling the climate change crisis and directly at odds with government policy. And he said that we will make no progress in reducing built environment carbon emissions to the level required until it is recognised that demolishing usable buildings to replace them with large new build schemes is no way to meet our climate change targets. And this, of course, is in the aftermath of um, COP26 and the government's very high profile um, pledges to reach net zero. So. Uh, this very this is the most recent news on this campaign, but um, Westminster City Council, who were in charge of deciding whether or not the planning application should go through, they gave permission, and uh, then it went to the Greater London Authority, overseen by the London Mayor Sadiq Khan, who um, at first gave permission for it to go ahead, and then um, we drew attention along with many others, including the Architects Journal, we drew attention to the fact that uh, the Simon Sturgis report was very critical 
about um, the carbon impacts and the sustainability impacts of the scheme. The mayor um, then recalled the application, assessed it again in light of the um, Sturgis report, but unfortunately still found in favour of letting the application go through. Since then, and only um, about two weeks later, um, Mr Gove, the Secretary of State for Communities, who ultimately is in charge of planning, has issued a holding order. And this is so that he and his ministers can um, inspect the proposals and see whether or not he thinks they warrant a call in. Now, this is a, this is a position that is very welcome from our point of view because we feel strongly that this application should be called in and all of the planning matters, but particularly the sustainability matters, should be scrutinised through a public inquiry. What we really need in this case is um, for demolition to be an exception rather than the norm. And what we absolutely need is for local authorities and planners who have the tools through legislation and through policy guidance to refuse these plans to do so. We need to see some really strong refusals um, from a planning perspective of demolition proposals so that we can um, set some precedents and actually put a marker in the sand to say that really demolition in a way like smoking or like wearing seat belts in cars it really should be seen as a last resort and not a first resort by building owners or developers and if we are going to meet our climate change commitments and uh, and to to meet all of the pledges that we have made in terms of sustainability this has to be the way forward and we're looking forward to seeing some new and um, really robust decisions coming forward in the future. Thank you very much. Henrietta, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm very curious to know uh, whether you engaged at all with AH AHMM before um, working on your alternative proposal with a different architect, but perhaps that's something we can come back to at the Q&A at the end. Um, so if anybody else has any questions for Henrietta, please do submit them on the box on your screen. But now I'm going to introduce Oliver Smith, who is our next speaker. He's a director at Fifth Studio, and he's going to talk to us about the practices, retrofit and extensive upgrading of the Grade 1 listed new court at Trinity College, Cambridge. Oliver. Hello, so I'm Oliver Smith from Fifth Studio. We're architects and urbanists working from studios in Cambridge, London and Oxford. And our work spans a range in scales from the work we did for the National Infrastructure Commission on the uh, strategy for new housing and infrastructure across the Oxford Cambridge Arc to the kind of bespoke reconstruction and retrofit of existing buildings. This is a 1960s office block in Norwich. Uh, but I'm going to talk today about the project we did for Trinity College here in Cambridge. New Court is a Grade 1 listed building built in the 1820s by William Wilkins. The college's brief was to provide 130-odd student bedrooms uh, to contemporary standards of character and amenity and comfort. They wanted us to renew the, the um, fabric of the facade but they really wanted us to concentrate on how far this building could be made sustainable in terms of its fabric and its systems. This is a picture of the earliest photo we found of the building in 1865. Uh, it looks pretty grim, but actually you can tell the, you can see the intention of William Wilkins in as much as the window surrounds and everything are, are of the same kind of tonality as the rendered, as his Roman rendered uh, facade. By 2009, whilst the stone exterior facade to the river was still in pretty good nick, the Portland cement render, the, the, the Portland cement rendering, re-rendering of the elevation in the 80, in the 1970s uh, had started to deteriorate and was clearly a really unfortunate kind of colour. And um, the brick elevation to the the street Garrett Hostel Lane had been patched up, but was also in pretty bad nick. In interiors had been iteratively um, done over by the addition of service risers, rooms carved up, rooms, new rooms inserted into loft spaces and uh, showers and all of the uh, contemporary kind of requirements of student life, showers, kitchens have been inserted, unfortunately, under stairs, on top of stairs and in the most incredibly kind of ad hoc manner. 
The opportunities for providing significantly sustainable accommodation in Trinity College were very limited. This is a map of Cambridge showing listed buildings. Trinity are all grade one, with the exception of one or two buildings on the street frontage. The co some in college felt that the answer was to demolish and rebuild New Court. Um, that was clearly going to be a very long, long shot in terms of listed building consent and planning. We did look at what would happen if we provided a sustainable energy source for the existing building. This is a overview of the college with the entire campus laid to short rotation coppice willow. Uh, as an April Fool, we looked at the provision of an unsustainable energy source with a fracking rig in Newcourt. And the fourth option, and the one that we really concentrated on, was the idea of retrofitting the existing building. And we adopted a three-step um, strategy to uh, emissions reductions. The first step being to fabric first, uh, half the demand for energy. The second being to double the efficiency of the systems using that energy. And the third, halving the carbon in the energy supply. And that would lead us to a position where the building hopefully was using not only an eighth of the energy, but emitting an eighth of the carbon. And that was in line with uh, what, were the, what was then government advice from the scientific advisor, David King. This is a picture of a completed building. And what you're looking at is a grade one listed interior with the original cornice in place, the original window surrounds, refurbished, the shutters brought back into use, the windows themselves, re, the original windows reglazed with a slim line um, double glazed units, and then fitted furniture containing all of the service distribution, lighting, and everything else. Here are some. Uh, other photos overlaid with drawings on the right, illustrating how the new services are installed uh, invisibly and therefore much more difficult to tamper with by students. And on the left, the in-situ monitoring that we installed behind the, behind the room linings, um, measuring moisture and thermal gradients through walls and the conditions of bits of existing timber that were, for obvious reasons, like floor joists built into walls, left in situ. What we've achieved in 2022, um, the college are now reporting that actually the energy use in the building is down by 80%. So we've overachieved in terms of the reduction in demand and system efficiency. Uh, and they are shortly, um, we understand, to install the ground source heat pump array, which will then take at least 50% out of carbon in the energy supply to new core. Having introduced the project, what I really want to go through is, is the kind of proofs of process and the lessons learned from, from doing this project. I think the proof side, which is a more cheerful side for us to start off with, is that our approach to character and heritage significance was successful in gaining consent and actually establishing a new um, policy uh, context for future projects. So on the heritage significance, we went through all the normal stuff, cataloging what the interiors are like, where there were significant or less significant elements of fabric or construction. But what we really looked at was how the building, uh, what the significance of the building was in the uh, early 21st century. And actually the greatest part of its heritage significance lies in its embodiment of the principles of collegiality. This is a, on the left, an image of the base of a staircase showing that this at this time the staircase was occupied by students graduates um teachers and and, uh, and the ex-master of the college and that every year the rooms were all stripped out ready for the new generation of students to come in so what was important about it was its robustness and adaptability to the changing demands of student population over the years rather than specific bits of fabric and skirting cornices or whatever uh, but to address all of this, we did build fairly detailed models and full-size maquettes of details. This is one looking, a series of images, um, looking at how our insulated wall lining was going to uh, reach the cornice or indeed not reach the cornice and, and expose the cornice in an interpretation of the MPPF guidance that, that um, intervention should be subtly discernible. So we've left rather than rather than uh, take the cornice off and plaster it back onto the new the new lining we've left it where it is and it's clear that that's where it is and that 
the wall lighting is a new intervention. In terms of other bits of methodology and strategy, we seriously addressed the issue of building physics and fabric risk. And we started by understanding exactly how the building operated when we found it. So that was a whole array of different kinds of monitoring, in situ value measurement, air pressure testing. And we modeled using WIFI, uh, a WIFI modeling program um, produced by the Fraunhofer Institute, different kinds of insulation to work out where the risks lay. And the top two images on this slide show the, st the standard output from WIFI, which quite frankly, as, as a sort of lay person in this, left me entirely uninformed. But addressing the issue that the risk was really that of creation of conditions for mold growth, we then got um, Max Wardham to, to map the conditions in the walls against the conditions for mold growth in, in three different substrates. And on the left, you can see that phenolic foam and a vapor barrier was going to be way over the um, legal conditions in the wall, way over the, the, the point at which we would start to get mycelium growth and spore germination. Whereas 100 mm wood fiber insulation, probably still too much, was way below that in terms of relative humidity and temperature. And we did extensive monitoring. This is a this is an output from the interstitial agrothermal gradient monitoring carried out by Archimetrics that show the conditions in the wall at various depths from the outside to the inside. And the yellow line starts at the beginning of the project, at the beginning of the uh, the construction project, and shows that actually. The yellow lines at the interface of brickwork and the insulation, and it shows that we've got high levels of relative humidity, and that's largely from the moisture in the lime plaster that we refinish the inside face of the walls with. But it drops over a year, it drops to about 60%, which is everybody agrees a very safe level of relative humidity given the internal temperatures. So, what we've ended up with is a building which, although it doesn't meet the individual criteria for NFIT and passive house retrofit. In terms of overall um, energy usage per meter squared per year is below the NFIT table three. Um, in terms of uh, the third element of research really, which was about planning policy and strategy and how we should approach um, this building consent, we decided in the end to frame the application as three questions. What are the heritage values of the existing buildings and their significance? To what extent are we gonna harm or benefit those values? And then really, how are those outweighed by ban um, benefits to heritage or other public benefits? And that might include reduced CO2 emissions, it might include uh, the research and monitoring experience, and it might um, include today's exercise in terms of knowledge transfer. This was very successful. We got we got consent at the first at the first uh, attempt and Cambridge City Council have now adopted the, the methodology, the strategy that we worked through with them uh, within the council's local plan in their policy for working with historic buildings. Uh, in terms of cost and payback, it's pretty clear that the uh, high the high cost of the fabric measures um, relative to the um, the kit, the MVHR or ground source heat pumps, uh, takes a longer time to pay back, but it's within the college's uh, refurbishment cycle. And actually, if you think that the life of an MVHR plant might only be 10.8 years, that's, that's the latest information we've had, then actually you've got to double that cost in order to get near to the the payback period. Um, and uh, similarly with the ground source heat pumps. But all of these were within the college's uh, refurbishment cycle, so they went ahead with that. In terms of lessons learned, I think the time scale was extraordinary and it can take a long, long time. So we started, we, were, we first looked at the building in 2009. We, the college approved our strategic approach in 2010. The building was completed in 2016 and we are now just getting to the end of the um, seven year monitoring cycle uh, agreed with the and in the list of building consent so it's dealing with heritage buildings of this significance it's it's a slow process um 
I think what we learned about site delivery is that the UK construction industry is not training employees with the skills relevant to retrofit work on heritage property. This, the labour force on site was largely trained to work with and produce service, surfaces that are level and straight and plain, often at odds with the character of historic spaces. They're used to using uh, regular sized and shaped components. So if you've got 160 spaces uh, and uh, different size and shape windows, doors, architraves in each one, then that completely throws them. They do their best, but it's very, very difficult to ensure that the original um, joinery elements went back in the right place. And they are, for example, very unused to working with materials like lime plaster, which not only uh, requires building up in, in, in a number of coats, but it has a strict working season. So actually the whole of the winter was kind of out for them and that significantly affected the programme. I would say that the shortage of suitably skilled site staff has not been made better by Brexit and then the subsequent pandemic. So it is much harder to find, for example, skilled lime plaster workers. To address those issues on Newcourt, we, um, we maintained a daily site presence trying to troubleshoot issues of workmanship as they arose rather than in snagging at the end of the contract. The contractor tripled his site maintenance management staff uh, over the course of the, the project. We had to prohibit use of certain technologies like power drivers in you know, fixing, fixing uh, historic um, joinery and so on. And, and we had to set up a running series of, of an iterative series of um, toolbox talks from the manufacturers of the plaster and the insulation and the firmicell lining material. So it was fairly intensive in management and um, quality uh, supervision. This is what they like doing, driving around in misted interiors um, with big diggers. This is a slightly better image. Um, all the windows were taken off site and a team of joiners very carefully installed the um, slimline double glazing. They do a really great job. But the issues of, of knowing where things had come from and where they were to go back, um, th these are all the window architraves for the job, all packaged up, all labelled. I say that the, the, the difficulty came when they came back to site and they were unwrapped and people forgot where they were supposed to go. I think in terms of other lessons, one of the things we learned from the monitoring, and this is again that image of the wall with the interstitial hydrothermal gradient monitoring in it, is that as well as providing reassurance that, that the building was performing as designed, it provided a fantastic early warning system. So when a tennis ball uh, got lodged in a, a gutter outfall and the water in the gutter backed up, uh, up into the roof and then down into the, uh, the buildup of the wall, the monitoring system picked it up long before the, um, that moisture became evident in the finishes of the room and the college were able to remove the tennis ball and didn't have to move the student out, didn't have to refinish the room. The conditions in the wall slowly uh, and safely returned to, to the, the, the pre-event records. So that's shown by the, the spikes in the, in the IGHM output on the right. In reality, the performance exceeded the model in terms of moisture risk, reduced energy consumption, air quality and comfort levels. This is uh, a histogram showing the CO2 levels in rooms. The, the MVHR is working, is working very well. Um, they have very good air quality in the rooms. And even if they do have a party, the levels return to below 600 parts per million and more generally about 400 parts per million very quickly after after that event is over. Uh, in terms of comfort, these are the polygons showing ideal and acceptable levels of comfort. We started off at the top right with conditions that sometimes were too cold and too dry for, 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 for um, occupant comfort. And we've ended up with conditions which are very, very largely within the ideal comfort polygon. And the, in terms of the residents of the building, we did a post-occupancy survey and uh, asked the question, um, would you recommend this room to someone else? 
uh, we thought 50% would be a would be a, a great result, but actually we had an 80% yes, and some great quotes from residents saying that it's the nicest place to live in college. Um, some of the rooms we found are overheating. So they are up to kind of 25 degrees, generally still within the acceptable comfort polygon, but sometimes outside it. And we traced this down with a college. We found that some of the hot water distribution circulation pipe work was not insulated. So that was effectively year long radiator into the space. We found that uh, the, both the client and the m and &E team, consultant m and &E team, uh, had been cautious about the performance of the MVHR unit and had added heater batteries to those. These have now been switched off. And we found, I mean, this is a, a really common problem uh, in overheating in retrofit projects, is the issue of window opening restrictors, which are added on to the brief on a health and safety basis to prevent occupants from falling out of the rooms, but these really do prevent the adequate natural ventilation of rooms in summer and the college have now removed these. I think uh, if I was being honest, I would say that the behavior interfaces, so the, the interface between the windows and the heating system that said, look, you don't need fresh air in the room, be uh, additional fresh air in the room because you've got an MVHR system delivering tempered fresh air to you. But if you open the windows in the winter, in the heating season, then the heating goes off. Uh, the other thing we did was put an absence detector in, which um, identified when someone hadn't been in the room for 48 hours and switched all the heating down to a set back temperature. I think those additional, th those interfaces added significant complexity to the heating controls, which were pretty expensive. And I think the college is now, I mean, as a result of the pandemic, have a much better way of identifying who's going to be in residence when. And I think the students have learned really quickly that they don't need to open the windows um, in order to get fresh air. So I think those are things that I probably wouldn't do again. Uh, and finally, um, I think we've learned a lot about the grid in the last, um, whatever it is, uh, 13 years. I think the speed at which the grid has become decarbonized has exceeded our expectations and the energy den the carbon density of electricity is a quarter of that that we were working with at the beginning of the project. But I think we've also learned that the capacity of the grid to power all electric heating and hot water across the UK is very limited. And this is going to restrict the scale of electrically powered air, river or ground source heat pumps. Analysis of the future energy um, scenarios published by the National Grid suggests that a decarbonized grid will have a supply capacity of only about 60 kilowatt hours per meter square per year for all uses. And the new core heating demand is currently at about 25 kilowatt hours. And on top of that, you've got to use occupational electrical usage, computers, lighting, whatever. So given that kind of headline from the uh, national grid, we think that to operate within this limit to reduce demand to this level is going to require all existing residential buildings listed or not to have a retrofit to circa new court standards. Thank you. Oliver, thank you very much for that. Some really useful lessons for people working on similar projects. Um, I think especially helpful to hear your thoughts on the things which possibly in retrospect weren't necessary or didn't justify the cost. Um, the obvious question is how you can take some of that learning and apply it to schemes where clients aren't in a position to take quite such a long time, long term view. But um, hopefully we'll come on to that later. So if you have questions for Oliver, please do submit them. We will have a Q&A with all the panelists at the end of the sessions. Um, now I'm going to introduce my next speaker. Uh, Peter Daniel, who's Product Innovation Director at the Roofalight Company. And Peter's going to talk to us about the challenge of delivering projects which are historically authentic, but also deliver on the standards of performance we expect today. Peter. Thank you. Um, so uh, today um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about delivering performance with conservation roof lights um, without sacrificing authenticity. So there's, there's, there's many types of uh, roof lights and roof windows that can be used in a historic context. Um, and 
what we're going to focus on today is making sure that that, that performance is delivered um, and we stay true to those uh, original conservation roof lights, those Victorian cast iron roof lights. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through a few slides um, discussing that um, and, uh, and things to be looking out for and to be considering. Um, so the first thing is that authentic detailing and as I mentioned staying true to the Victorian originals. When um, we look at, um, as you can see here on this slide, um, we've got a, some salvage units here. So these have been extracted from a building and uh, we can pick up some key pointers in terms of um, how these units were designed, the original ones. Um, so we can look at things like the stepped glazing edge, which uh, was originally there to allow uh, the water to run off the glazing and not to be trapped by the, the surrounding putty. We can also look at things like the glazing clips um, obviously, if these were held in with uh, with putty, there was also the risk of uh, glass sliding off the building. So those glazing clips had a uh, an original purpose to just protect that glass and make sure it didn't slide out or, or, or there'd be a, uh, an issue with the units. There was also exposed hinges, which is uh, a common feature of the original designs, and the integral glazing bar, uh, which was part of the part of the frame. And also, as I just mentioned earlier, that putty facing, that slim facing that, uh, that, that held that held that glass in place. Now, these these originals here, they're salvaged. They've 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 had a long life um, and it's about taking um, those essences, those nuances, those elements of authenticity and bringing those in to the modern conservation roof lights uh, and ensuring that that isn't lost or sacrificed. So if we flip back to um, the previous images, um, and we can sort of transpose that back over uh, to a modern conservation roof light. So um, as I talked about earlier, that stepped edge there with the single glazing. Um, in conservation roof lights and roof windows now, um, we use double glazing or triple glazing to get the modern performance um, and to get those um, to, to, to get those good U values and good thermal efficiency. Um, but again, it's it's mimicking the um, the elements and the authenticity of that original um, cast iron Victorian conservation roof light. So the steps units, as you can see on this unit here, um, they just add to the to the overall aesthetic. Um, you can also see the glazing clips as well have been retained. Um, with modern performance uh, and modern products, you don't really need those glazing clips, but transferring them over just again adds the character of the product itself. Exposed secure hinges now. So the exposed hinges are there. You can't quite see it uh, on this image, but just along that back gully there, um, there are the exposed hinges that you'd expect to find on a conservation roof light. Um, but there's options now for, for security. And then the glazing bar, which is the thing that I think most people recognise with a conservation roof light. Um, these days, it's the thermally decoupling those glazing bars. So not part of the original frame, it's about ensuring that we're getting the thermal performance. So the units you can see here now, that's actually one piece of glass, um, but it's been designed in such a way where those glazing bars are put on and they're as true and authentic to the original as possible. Um, and, and that's sort of reinforced really with the uh, silicon facing, uh, which replicates what the putty did originally. Um, it's using that new, uh, materials, the longevity of the new materials uh, and the performance of the new materials uh, to ensure that you get the performance you'd expect of any uh, modern window or roof window but not sacrificing those original conservation features. Another element to think about really with conservation roof lights which is quite key is flushness and it's more than just aesthetics. So as you can see here on this video uh, we've got some conservation roof lights installed uh, and they're installed uh, it, it, extremely flush uh, to, to the building. Um, so what you can see from this thermal analysis here on the right hand side is if that roof light sits proud, and we can just see here that element of how it sits above, above the rafters, it's more exposed. And that doesn't just look sort of detrimental to the character and the historic character of the building, it also introduces the wind chill factor. So this happens with any roof light or roof window that's placed uh, proud within the roof. You're lowering the external temperature 
of the frame, the more of that frame that is exposed to the wind chill. And that in a turn um, has a detrimental impact to the performance, the thermal performance uh, of the window um, and the uh, declared thermal performance of the window. So ensuring that the unit is flush within the roof um, is more than just aesthetics, it's impacting that performance as well. Another element to look at now is the thermal performance itself. And it's the whole window value that we need to consider, not just settling for that centre pane only value. Um, there are elements within the building regulations for historic context that allow you to focus on centre pane values, but you don't necessarily need to do that when you're utilising a conservation roof light that's built uh, with modern performance uh, requirements uh, in mind. So um, typically uh, we've got that centre pane value, so that what we call that UG, that U value through the glazing. And that considers literally just that center point uh, of the glass panel. So if you have quite a big glass panel, um, that can have quite a, a significant impact on the overall thermal performance of the window. If you have a unit that's made up of lots of individual double glazed units, then effectively what you've got is a smaller center pane area and a larger frame area. So that's really quite important. So when you're looking at conservation roof lights, understanding whether it's one whole piece of glass or several units um, that have been placed into one frame is quite important because if it is several units, then the frame factor becomes even more important. And the frame factor, the UF value, is where we're looking at that heat loss through the perimeter frame of the roof window, the conservation roof light. Um, and that needs to be taken in conjunction with what's called the edge effect. So that is the heat loss that escapes through the junction between the glazing and the frame itself. So when we're looking at that, the true U value, that's the U, UW value, the U value of the window as a whole, is a combination of the following. The heat loss through the glazing, the heat loss through the frame, and the heat loss through the phrasing glazing junction. And it's never the heat loss of the glazing value uh, on its own. So as you can see here on this image to the right hand side, um, we've got a conservation roof light here that is actually, it's one piece of glass. So it's got quite a good centre pane value and there's quite a large centre, centre pane area, but you can see where that frame is. Um, and we need to ensure that that is part of that total, total heat loss calculation. Um, and a modern conservation roof light will quote you a UW value um, and not just a, a centre pane um, or a UG, UG value. Another element to look at is uniqueness uh, and designing the roof light to fit the building. Um, so here's a, a project um, that um, we worked on previously, and uh, this is a roundhouse uh, in Derby. And this was the 1860s original building. So this was a roundhouse for an engine works uh, where they manufactured uh, steam engines. And you can see here an, an original photograph of the 1860s building and the conservation and, and the roof lights that were uh, that, that, that span the entire uh, circumference uh, of the building itself. And then in the mid 20th century, there was a what I call an unsympathetic refurb to that building. And you can see how elements and you know, significant elements of the character of the building uh, have been lost. And the roof lights were uh, quite a, a significant factor in that in that overall design aesthetic. And through to the present day, um, where you can see how the original uh, character of that 1860s uh, structure has been brought back to life through the work that the architects have done and the contractors um, and how um, we worked uh, on the, uh, the, the, the roof light element. And the thing that's important about uniqueness, really, and, and, a, and a roof window, a conservation roof window system that can be adapted to suit the uniqueness of the building. So in this example here, uh, the truss rafters were, were all originals that were repaired. Uh, that meant that the, the difference between each of the facets on these buildings uh, was subtly different. Um, it could be sort of 10 or 12 millimetres here or there, two or three or four degrees here or there in the angles of each of these conservation roof lights. So each one you see around the perimeter of this building is individual and it's unique. Um, but it's true to that original building. So we, we're, we're not cutting, cutting out and replacing, we're working with the character of the building uh, and we're utilising a modern system with modern performance that can be tailored to suit and to ensure that none of that 
uh, character of the building uh, and authenticity is lost and we're working with it so it's it's about performance um, it's about uniqueness uh, and it's about having a system that you can actually tailor uh, to work with the heritage and the context of the building itself so to finalize really it's it's all about how we can ensure that we're delivering that modern performance without sacrificing authenticity, whether that be flushness, whether that be thermal performance, whether that be working with the historic nature of the roof. These are just some of the elements that uh, we can work with um, and that you don't need to sacrifice that authenticity and you can obtain that modern performance uh, with a conservation roof line. Thank you, Peter. Um, in view of uh, Oliver's comments earlier, I'm very curious to know whether you're finding that you um, are actually able to find the skills on site to deal with cases where you have multiple bespoke elements. But um, again, we'll come to that later. If you have a Q&A for Peter, please do submit it now. Um, and I'm going to introduce our final speaker, Catherine Croft, who's the director of the 20th Century Society. Catherine is going to talk to us about some of the challenges in retrofitting 20th century buildings. And um, she's also going to bust some of the misinformation that's out there about the real cost of demolition. Catherine. At C20 Society, we've been advocating the reuse of buildings from the day we started. Uh, and although our primary objective is to preserve buildings because we think they're of architectural or historic value, we've long been citing the environmental benefits of reuse as a compelling additional reason not to demolish. We were early signatories of AJ's Retro First campaign, and we really welcome the ever increasing understanding of the benefits of refurbishment over new build right across the sector. However, we think there's still a long way to go in terms of practical research into the methods of upgrading buildings and meaningful methods of quantifying the sustainability credentials of individual projects. And um, I think that at the moment we're in a position where retrofit is simultaneously having both a positive and a negative effect on heritage outcomes. So on the one hand, um, increased pressure to reuse existing buildings should definitely mean the number of heritage buildings demolished um, is reduced. And the idea that the greenest building is one that already exists is obviously um, very friendly to, to what we're trying to achieve. But um, on the other hand, we are increasingly aware that doing sensitive environmental upgrade can be really difficult when, for heritage buildings and particularly for 20th century ones. Um, and we've been facing lots of issues around, around that. So to look at those two sides in a little bit more detail, um, I think what we are really aware of is that not all retrofit schemes keep the same percentage of existing building fabric, um, very obviously. And here on the left is a slide of the Park Hill Flats in Sheffield, a grade two listed building and heralded by Historic England as a, success, as a successful conservation project. We were um, really concerned by the loss of historic fabric um, that this particularly stage one proposed. And, and this slide of um, maximum strip out, you know, shows that a huge amount of, of the building fabric here ended up in the skip. Um, we are really pleased that the second phase of the Park Hill development, the Mikhail Riches scheme, which is currently on site, reuses much more of the um, historic fabric and I think that shows um, a really encouraging trend um, but um, but the the this phase one is still being cited as uh, both a conservation and an environmental success story and um, it's been you know, quoted that, that that keeping the concrete frame here um, saved a potential 3,219 tonnes of CO2 um, you know which is all very well but an awful lot more could have been saved. And then the, both the heritage and the environmental outcomes, I think could have been much, much better. Um, on the, the, other, the other side of things, on the upgrading issue, I, um, I'm going to bring you, draw your attention to this publication by the, um, the Getty Conservation Institute. The Getty has been doing a lot of really great work uh, about um, improving approaches to upgrading 20th century buildings. And this latest book of case studies, I think is probably the, the best source that I've found out there as to how to, to achieve 
um, it's environmental upgrade that's sensitive in heritage terms as well as as de delivering on those um, conserv on the environmental um, criteria as well. So I think that probably we we have some questions that we um, want to to address. Um, you know what what does constitute retrofit what percentage of total building fabric is being retained how do we measure that how much credit should be given to recycling existing fabric as opposed to keeping it on site and and where does the heritage significance of a building lie and what percentage of those elements that are of heritage significance is being kept in in these schemes um, and, um, and when we're looking at the upgrading issues, I think we are really aware of some key reasons why 20th century buildings in particular are challenging. Um, those are listed on the right here that, you know, many of the buildings that we're looking at now, particularly the buildings of the um, 60s and 70s, were built at a period when the idea of cheap energy seemed um, you know, limitless, environmental impact was just not appreciated. And um, we were all in love with air conditioning. And a lot of these buildings are built with very deep plans that re rely on air conditioning. Lightweight construction has low thermal mass. And um, with um, increased temperatures, the um, solar gain problems from very extensive glazing are um, getting considerably more problematic. So I think, you know, that for us, we, what we are increasingly focusing on is um, how we as a heritage organisation can contribute usefully to the question of calculating the embodied energy of existing buildings and how to really um, make sure that the um, statistics that we're looking at make us able to make really meaningful comparisons between um, retrofit and new build. Um, and then we're also looking to how we can develop and share good practice for sensitive upgrade of his of heritage buildings as well. And I wanted to um, just um, kind of show you a few examples of, of, of current projects on site or about to happen that I think kind of um, demonstrate the um, where we are at the moment and the kind of confused rhetoric in particular around retrofit. So this is probably um, one of the most publicly viewed building sites in London at the moment. This is the site of uh, Millennium Bridge House, which was by Seaford and Partners, built from 1987 to 8. Um, and as you can see here, it's uh, right in front of St Paul's. So you can view the site from as you walk across the Millennium Footbridge and it's right opposite Tate Modern. Loads and loads of people are, are seeing this um, building site every single day. Um, and although this um, Seafoot building, sort of late example of POMO, isn't one that 20th Century Society campaigned for the um, retention of on heritage grounds, we didn't think it um, um, met the, the criteria that you know, we didn't think it was a we didn't really think it was an exciting enough building for us to be involved with um we i i am concerned about the the way that this built this site is being represented in terms of its environmental um benefits uh, and um so this is the the site as it is at the moment and as you can see on the left uh it's being stripped right back to the frame and um and beyond really but yet the the rhetoric around all this is all about um you know our commitment to the planet and um that um 69 retained structure i think this is being really positioned as an environmentally incredibly friendly and sensitive project and i think we just need to be um better able to critique the statistics that we're um, having put in front of us at the moment, um, both within the profession and because of the enormous um, energy that, that developers and um, um, professionals are putting into communicating with the public, we really need to be educating the public to be critical um, receivers of this information. Um, this, this is a 20th century society case. This is the um, existing Museum of London uh, building in the city 
and Bastion House. And these were both designed by Powell and Moyer, um, major post-war uh, architecture firm, most famous for doing the Skylon at the Festival of Britain site, and then the um, Churchill Gardens estate opposite Battersea Power Station. And again, um, this is one where the, um, the arguments in, in, against um, retention have very much centered on um, justifying rebuild in terms of the environmental benefits. And I just think it's quite useful to actually look at the um, documentation submitted with the, the planning application and um, um, analyze that. And, and when we are thinking about how we can best make um, arguments in favor of retention. So um, this is from the, some of that planning documentation. And I mean, it said, not surprisingly, you know, significant remedial work is required to bring these buildings back into um, safe use. And it would be carbon intensive. I mean, you know, that sort of is stating the absolute obvious, but it's um, the, the way that this, this, this narrative is, is constructed, I think is trying to make um, the reasonable conclusion be that um, that redevelopment is preferable in environmental terms um, to sensitive retrofit. Um, and, um, and it carries on, you know, I mean, it, it, it says the work has been focused on embodied carbon. Um, they've got all the jargon, maximizing the circular economy principles and, um, and um, the kind of final line that says that the present design team believes up to 90% of the existing of the existing site can be recycled, but that, you know, that's recycled um, in any form and definitely not reusing the existing building fabric on site in the most um, environmentally friendly way. Um, don't know where that 90% is going to end up. Um, I am um, very aware that, that the um, BRE, the, the BREAM standards have um, We've been, we've been with us for a while and we've, there's been a lot of useful work done on um, how those need to be specifically um, tweaked and um, adapted to make sure that they um, are, are appropriate with existing buildings and historic buildings in particular. And I think that some of that work's been really useful. Um, and um, um, I think that we're in a, position where we really need to be having a similar analysis of the um, methodologies around retrofit and, and um, how we quantify that so that we, we, we really kind of understand what we're talking about and we talk about its applicability to um, both historic buildings and particularly listed and heritage buildings. Um, and um, there's a lot of good work that Historic England's been doing about energy efficiency and historic buildings. This is one of their publications, but I think they are still on the whole seeing um, that as being mainly applicable to solid wall masonry buildings of the sort of pre-1914 period and, um, and the modern buildings which operate um, as the, the slide here on the right shows in a very different way, particularly in terms of um, how they deal with um, water and um, 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 the movement of moisture through construction. Um, are, are, you know, they're not, we haven't really looked in detail at how modern building systems can be upgraded to improve environmental performance and in particular, how to do that without losing what's significant about them in, in architectural and historic terms. So um, just coming back to finish with the, um, uh, that book from the Getty that I was recommending earlier, um, this actually suggests that there might be four really useful st strategies for 20th century heritage retrofit, which I've listed here, um, enhancing original features, looking at systems, looking at glazing, and looking at those issues about insulation and the air barrier within a building. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot more work to be done on this. Obviously, a lot of buildings will need to attract, need to address more than one of those issues. Um, and 
um, I think we see that our role in 20th century is in part to encourage people to take these issues really seriously and to make sure that we um, you know, look in detail at, at good examples of, of best practice and, and get those um, examples out there and to encourage other people to, to, to follow um, in those footsteps. Just wanted to finish up with one really good example. This is a, um, a, um, the Olivetti building on the UNESCO site in Avira, um, which because it's um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site has had an incredibly sensitive um, upgrade to it. And um, um, I think that um, um, the, the, the methodology that has um, been developed perhaps as, as part of this, this is from um, this is a French methodology. Um, and um, I think that we need to be kind of um, applying these kind of rig rigorous matrices, matrices to the way that we assess um, uh, upgrade systems for, um, for, for, for buildings, both buildings that are listed and, and are of particularly um, high heritage value, but really these um, um, techniques are really useful for any building where we actually feel that there is some um, architectural or heritage value in the existing fabric and they're not buildings that we want to completely reinvent, rebrand and, and um, really present as a new building where we want some sort of continuity with the, the existing um, form of the building. And um, that's all from me. If you're not a member of 20th Century Society, um, please consider joining us. We do um, what a lot of work to preserve 20th century buildings and to run trips and events to, to celebrate the best of them. Catherine, thank you. Um, that really brings home the extent of research that's being done by all sorts of different organisations into how to upgrade our listed building stock, but also the very pressing need for um, a coordinated approach, not just to the research, but to communications within mm -hmm. the profession and of course to the right wider public um, and obviously that's where campaigning organizations come in and hopefully we'll come on to that in the q a session um, but now i'd like to join all of the speakers so henrietta oliver and peter to join catherine and myself jason what questions do we have from people watching um are there any plans from the government to reduce vat on repairs or retrofitting to listed buildings <laughs> So what do we know about the government's plans to make uh, the VAT system a bit more favourable to everything we're all trying to achieve? Um, I think we just don't understand why they haven't already done it and why, if they haven't done it already, why they aren't doing it tomorrow. I mean, it seems such a complete no-brainer. Um, and um, when the original excuse was that we couldn't do it because of the EU, but post-Brexit, we kind of hoped it might happen um, without any fuss. And I really don't understand why it's not um happened and i think everyone is lobbying hard for it and um you know um, contact your local mp and give him a hard time um. okay good good sound <laughs> advice there thank you um jason what else do we have from the audience sure i'm going to link uh, kind of two two questions together so the, the first goes how can architects improve the efficiency of small scale heritage projects you know, such as victorian townhouses in city centers where floors floor space is at a premium and kind of leading on from that are there any studies as to the size of the building or project required for retrofit to be viable Ooh, okay I'm going to put that um to Peter actually first yeah um one of the things that we know from Victorian townhouses is that you know they tend to have a very deep plan um, and they go back quite a long way. Um, so one of the things that um, we would look from our perspective um, is how you can introduce into that sort of um, uh, small floor space, top lighting from above, um, and make the best use of that space. Um, and that's something that you can do um, quite easily with light from above um, and create some really good workable space um, and um, uh, make use of what typically could be a, a dead space within that building um, and uh, bring it back into life. So, you know, we've got a lot of people these days working from home, uh, want home office space. Um, that can be achieved quite easily with some great overhead lighting, um, natural lighting uh, that can be brought in through roof lights, whether that be flat roof lights, whether that be um, 
uh, pitch roof windows um, and can create a really nice environment to work within. Um, and um, like you say, um, those those small floor spaces can be um, can be utilised really, really, really well. Um, it takes a bit of imagination um, and sometimes it may take something that's a little bit bespoke and unique to do that. Um, but certainly, it, it, you know, it can be achieved. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's something that we've seen that our projects used um, you know, significantly and intensively um, over many projects, really. Thank you. Um, Jason, can I ask you to read the second of those two questions? And Oliver, we're going to put this to you, if that's OK. Sure. Um, are there any studies as to the size of a building or project required for retrofit to be viable? Not that I know of. Um, <laughs> But 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 I mean I, I I'm going to partly answer the previous question, which is that that um, the viability of retrofit and, and and the extent to which you can reduce your energy demand depends on where you're losing your energy in the first place. So yes, you may have small spaces that preclude putting three or four inches of internal insulation, but actually maybe you're losing a lot of heat through drafts and around windows as well as through them. And I think there are ways of dealing with historic windows that are relatively economic that can dramatically reduce your heat loss and improve your comfort levels. And there's a lot of work being done on on, on the, those underfloor voids in Victorian terrace houses and how you insulate those yet maintain the ventilation that keeps them rot free and so on. So I think I think there isn't a minimum, I think there isn't a threshold for viability, but I think it just, I, th I think there are very few one size fits all solutions and you just need a, an architect or a builder just prepared to think about it a little bit carefully before launching into work. I mean, the Welsh government are looking at how to retrofit all of those um, all of those Victorian terraces in all those mining towns, and um, <coughs> and there's a fantastic report being published on how you would do that in a very simple way. Well, I suppose, um, you know, the ideal thing is obviously to find mechanisms to lump those projects together, isn't it? And that's why housing associations in particular have, have led the way and neighbourhood groups are so important um, and why we all want to see slightly um, improved provision of council housing and custodianship of council housing. Well, this is related to you know, the, the latest energy kind of hikes cost hikes so have the payback periods been recalculated since you know, the latest energy costs increases presumably one has to make assumptions on the future you know energy costs mm. oh okay well i might actually sorry go back to oliver for that because obviously oliver in your talk you um spoke a lot about the sort of pay payback period that your client was able to commit to and handle what what are the implications of the recent changes in prices uh, it makes it all the more viable. I mean, I, I haven't recalculated based on the recent energy uh, energy costs, uh, and I'd have to get to, to find out what the what the colleges are paying as a kind of aggregate tariff for the energy, which is much less than we would pay as householders. But um, no, I haven't recalculated. But I, I think energy price rises will um, increase the pressure for retrofit. Uh, I, I'm going back to an earlier question. Yeah, the VAT has got to has got to come down on domestic retrofit projects as well as you know, the, the, the heritage that we're talking about today. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, any more questions that are coming in? Of course, we've got plenty here. Um, so, Fifth Studio conducted an exhaust an exhaustive studio a study regarding building performance before carrying out work or enduring. But has this done been done for buildings of other areas? Eras one thinks of the buildings Henrietta and Catherine mentioned, for which such data would be really interesting to know. Okay, well, um, Henrietta, let's go to you for that question. I mean, do you have the resources to carry out that sort of research? Yes. No. Personally, we don't um, have the resources to carry out these comprehensive studies, but um, what we try to do is encourage local authorities to um, require them so that the um, developer and the, or the building owner, the onus is on them to um, provide this data. And what we're really interested in, and that we mentioned in the report, the Simon Sturgis report on the MS building, is this um, whole life carbon assessment. So you're looking at the embodied energy of the building as well as the operational energy and um, you're taking all those into account when looking at 
um, comprehensive refit versus demolition. Um, so what we'd like to see is um, these carbon assessments coming forward um, as a matter of course as part of the planning application so that we have data that we can begin to compare and analyse. And um, Henrietta, on that note, uh, how do you actually fund, I mean, you, you referenced two quite chunky studies in your presentation, uh, which both sounded fantastic. So there was obviously um, University of Westminster, um, well, actually three, then Mark Hines did the kind of, the, I think yeah. slightly quicker probably kind of analysis of the relative costs of retrofit um versus demolition and then of course you did sign surges report so who who funds that so um we so we have a network of different advisors and um architects that we work with and um we are lucky to work with people like mark hines who do things for us um at a uh, reduced rate because we have a long-term relationship with them and, and you know we support each other in, in, in what we do and um also uh simon sturgis was uh generous enough to you know to uh allow us to uh ask for a reduced rate too so you know i mean it's all part of getting the message out there and um we obviously we don't we we want to contribute and to, as much as we can but there is a recognition that we can't necessarily pay um full back but um, we're really delighted when we can, you know, work with other people and um, and contribute to the, to this research. And the, the good thing about us is that we have a wide national network, and we can publicise these um, figures and the and the really important work that our collaborators do with us. And so there's a lot in it for the people who work with us as well. I think it's interesting, though, isn't it, how um, organisations like the Century Century Society have had to almost um, reinvent yourselves very quickly to become very immersed in this sort of technical data. Um, and I wanted actually to ask you and Catherine, but I'll ask you first, uh, well, I've got you, <laughs> whether that kind of conflicts with, in a way, your more traditional skills of actually making very clear assessments about architectural and historic value. Oh, I, t I no, I think they go completely um, very well together. Actually, I think this idea, and this is firmly rooted in the the safe tradition of what we have been doing for many years, which is coming up with reuse solutions um, for these buildings. We don't just say no to demolition. We say we bring together architects and engineers to come up with reuse solutions. And of course, you can't do that now without looking at the environmental cost. And when you take into account the environmental cost just simply for the demolition and the construction costs in terms of carbon energy. It makes perfect sense to keep the existing building. And um, so for me, I, I don't see any conflict there at all. And what you can do, therefore, is end up by keeping a great building and making, extending its lease of life and giving it a whole new chapter of um, activity and memories and, and experiences for people to enjoy in the future. I really think it's got to be part of what we do. And, um, and it's a really important component of the, of the um, wider heritage debate. Um, so Catherine, can I um, quickly ask you to comment on this is a related point really, because you mentioned how, for example, the CFIT building, you didn't deem to be quite exciting enough to take on yeah. as a case study. Um, are, are there instances where, say, you and uh, Henrietta would disagree over the value of a building? Um, I don't. I don't think we've disagreed yet, um, um, and um, um, I mean, I think we we quite often work in in quite close parallel. Um, not least because um, 20th Century Society has a much broader role, and we um, we have a statutory role in the planning system. So we're trying to comment on a vast array of cases all across the country, and we don't have the resources always to do the kind of in-depth reports that. Um, that um, SAVE is able to do. So, I mean, we were involved very early on with the m and building and um, with the, um, 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 well, the, 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 all, all those cases that you were presenting, Henrietta, but, um, but it's fantastic when, when SAVE has got the, the scope to, um, um, you know, to just push that much further and, and produce those sorts of very cogent reports, which I think are, are really helping to 
change the discussion. Jason, let me go back to you. What else do we have from the audience? Yeah, we've got a question. I think I might know who this one is for. Um, how are the glazing bars embedded into the pane? Um, not well, how are they how, how is that done, and how do they not result in a thermal bridge? Uh, Peter, it will come as no surprise. <laughs> I'm going to choose you to answer that question. I thought that might come my way. Um, yeah, so how, how do they work? So um, a, a, the original cast iron um, roof light, they were, they were moulded as part of the original frame. Um, and then the sort of first iteration of conservation roof lights, again, they were part of the, the frame sections as well. Um, but ultimately, they have a thermal bridge, as we know, and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, critical point for heat loss. Um, so um, one of the things that we do on our systems um, is we utilise, we still utilise metallic um uh, uh, glazing bar systems, uh, but we have a specific extrusion that we use for the outside one, um, which um, literally um, mimics the top edge you could see of the original uh, one. So it gets a whole effort of creating this extrusion just to give you a three millimeter piece of metallic profile. Um, that's bonded, uh, strictly bonded to the outside of the glass panel. Um, and then we have a, a metallic internal glazing bar, which again is strictly bonded to the inside. And then that interfaces with the frame around the inside. So ultimately, there is nothing that's um, between there's, um, the inside and the outside glazing bars that you do not touch. Um, so they're either side um, of, of the glass panels. Um, that means um, then we can um, we can make sure there's no subtle bridge through there. Um, but we've done it in such a way that we can um, we can try and keep that authenticity. Um, so um, yeah, um, so they're strictly bonded on. And then, like I say, the the external ones. Uh, are then we have a, a silicon uh, glazing there, which is hand applied and. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing when you see them, the skills crafts, crafts people that are actually putting that on um, and, and, and making that replicate. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's no thermal bridge there at all, um, which means that we can uh, harness the, the great uh, set of PV values that we can get from modern glazing now. Um, typically with our products now, we're using a, a one centre pane um, U value uh, in all our products. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's how we do it. Um, and, uh, and and it's patented as well, so um, it's, uh, it's a lot of effort goes into it behind the scenes to make something that looks exactly like the original. Uh, thank you for that, Jason. We've got time for one last question. So, is there anything that is kind of coming up again and again? Uh, yes. Well, thank you, the old voting system we have inside. I'm going to read out one. Um... Are there examples of how to negotiate the use of more sustainable materials, such as cork, over heritage-friendly ones, such as stock brick? Oh, Oliver, do you feel equipped to answer that? Obviously, Newhall was very traditional materials, but you do work on much more sort yeah. of edgy schemes, don't you? Yeah, and, and I think that there is there is an opportunity to, to negotiate that. I mean, I, I can't... Immediately think of one where we've we've um, where we've taken that on, but um, it's po it's possible to have um, pretty sensible conversations with planning conservation officers and the immunity societies and Catherine and and Henrietta about about what are the real values of a building in terms of heritage significance and and what can we change and and how do we how do we retain the essential aspects of character and whatever, whilst r radically changing perhaps the construction and the materials and the way that the building performs thermally. So uh, to go for it. <laughs> Great. So we're going to end on an upbeat note. Um, it's been a fantastic webinar. Uh, again, if you missed anything, we will be sending out a recording of the whole morning. So don't worry. Uh, if we didn't get to answer your question, if you email us, we will try and send it to the right person and get your response. Um, and now I want to thank our four speakers, um, Henrietta Billings, Oliver Smith, Peter Daniel, and Catherine Croft. A uh, huge thanks to our partners, the Reflight Company, and thank you all very much for watching.